Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of The Dean Show. My name is Indeen, I'm your host Eddie, and this is the all new show on Islam and Muslims. Thank you for coming to the source to learn about the most misunderstood way of life in the world today, which is practiced by over 1.5 billion human beings all around the world. So we want to help you develop a better understanding. And there are certain issues and myths that we like to clear up here on the show. One of them, which is prominent in the world today, is the idea that God Almighty, the Creator, can be a man. So we're going to be discussing this topic with our next guest and giving you some of the top 10 reasons why God Almighty cannot be a man. One note here is that we're going to be discussing something that might be a little sensitive to some people about one who is beloved to our hearts. His name is Jesus. We want to note that everyone knows before we start that we love Jesus. Jesus in Islam, which means surrender and submission to the creator of the heavens and the earth alone without any partners, is one of the mightiest messengers that God has sent to deliver the same message that started from the beginning of time. That there's only one God that you worship, that God alone without no associates. So today our next guest, he's a former Christian minister, actually a youth minister, and he accepted Islam several years back. He's going to help us tackle this topic. So sit tight, you don't want to go nowhere. We're giving you the top 10 reasons why Jesus, peace be upon him, cannot be God. We'll be right back on The Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum salam, brother. Thank you for uh, coming to be with us again. Thank you for inviting me. Always, it's always a pleasure to be on the Dean Show. Now, this is Joshua Evans. He has a special section on the DeanShow.com. You go and click on his picture, and he has a bunch of topics that me and him have uh, discussed yes. on prior shows. Now, I want to make a note. Some people, we're not trying to hurt nobody's feelings. We're trying to deliver the truth. And I want people to know that we love Jesus. He's very dear Absolutely. to us. He is one of the mightiest messengers that God has sent to Absolutely. humanity. He was sent to the children of Israel at that time, correct? Yes. He did many mighty miracles by the permission of God. Yes. And he healed the sick, the blind, yes. the lepers, correct? Absolutely. Gave life to the dead by God's permission. All of that. All that good stuff, right? He was the Word of God on he earth. He was the Word of God. Okay. But... He never claimed divinity. No, he never claimed divinity. And one of the amazing things about Islam that everyone should know is that we are the only other religion that is a tenet of faith that you must believe in Jesus Christ. And everything that he did or you cannot be a Muslim. If that is missing, if you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It is a tenet of our faith to, to believe in and love Jesus Christ. So you don't believe in him, you're out you, of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. Top 10 reasons why Jesus cannot be God. Let's get right to it. Cannot be God. Number 10. Number 10, the first reason, and we're going to try to go in a descending order. Top 10 reasons, working our way to the number one most important reason. The first reason, beginning at the beginning, that Jesus cannot be God. And the reason why we are going over this topic is because it's an issue of salvation. We want everyone to be saved. And this issue is a very important issue for Christians, Muslims, Jews, why Jesus cannot be God. And the first number one reason is that God cannot be born. God did not come into existence. He's always existed. He did not come into existence from non-existence. He was not born. He was not created. He has always been before there was even a thing called time. And we, as we all know, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born. He was born without a father. Yes, indeed, that was one of his true miracles. But he was indeed born. He was in the womb for nine months, and he was born. So that, by its very nature, shows that he does not have the same quality and characteristics that God has. God cannot be born. Jesus was born. So those two people cannot be one and the same. 
That's number 10 now. That's number 10, so very clearly. So God had no beginning. No beginning. Jesus, peace be upon him, had a beginning. Had a beginning. Okay, number 9, let's get to Number it. 9 would be that there are no explicit verses in any scriptural text, especially the Bible, that say so. Now, God, when he speaks of things, when he talks of his own characteristics and who he is, he is very, very explicit. For instance, in, in Isaiah 46 and 9, G, uh, God says that I am God and then there, no, there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. You, uh, also, the verses that Jesus quoted, he said, Hear, O Israel, which is one that is quoted in the Jewish synagogues every, uh, every time they have service. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is but one God, and then there is none else. And we all know the verses. You can go through the Old Testament and read about God's characteristics when he describes himself. It is always explicit. Now, there are some verses in the New Testament which can be implicitly interpreted as Jesus having claimed some type of divinity. But if that was such a big characteristic, if it was such a big deal that Jesus was God, if this was the way to salvation, that he was God in the flesh, come to sacrifice himself for the sins of humanity, then that is something God would have been explicit about because it is an issue of salvation. God does not beat around the bush about these type of issues when it comes to who he is. He is very clear with the children of Israel. I am God. There is none like me. Do not worship anything else. Period. And Jesus came and quoted the same very verses. So if it would have been an issue of salvation that he was God, he would have very clearly stated, I am God. I am God. He would not have told the, the Jews when they said that you call yourself God. He said, you say that I am. He would have very clearly said, yes, I'm God. And I'm here to save you from your sins. He never stated that in anywhere, and it's never referenced in any scriptural text of any religion whatsoever. So therefore, if God is so explicit about his nature, why when it comes to him becoming a man, why did he not explicitly state so? Explicit, meaning explicit. that it's lucid, it's clear, it's, clear it's cut un the unambiguous, yes. something unequivocal. It's not something that you need a scholar to interpret. If, if God's nature was that he was coming in the form of a man, he would have made it so even a five-year-old child could understand Let's that. be fair. Now, I want to be really fair, all right? We got some theologians, some Bible scholars that will come and disagree with you. They say, you know what? John 1, 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was a God, and the, the word, word became, became God. God and uh, another word one, became flesh and dwelt among us. And then I am, before Abraham was, I am. Now, me as a layman... Uh, personally, you know, I don't really, if I'm reading that, it's a little bit ambiguous, but you go ahead and comment on this. Well, it, that also comes from what standpoint you look at those verses as. If you look at them from an aspect that you've never heard of the Trinity, you've never heard that Jesus came in the form of a man, then these verses would not say that to you. These verses will not say anything other than what they are meant to say. For instance, in the beginning was the Word, the Word became, we also believe that Jesus was God's word made manifest. That's what, that's what he is. God said to him, be, and he was. He was God's spoken word on this earth. So we believe that verse. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We believe that verse. We just interpret it in the light of everything else that God has said. When you put it in the light of everything that God has always said, it always makes sense. But if you want to take those verses out and try to prove a point with them, I can say that God doesn't exist and I can go and find you some verses from the Bible, put them together and be like, look, there's 10 verses right here that show God does not exist. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You can make the Bible say anything you want to. You can make the Quran say anything you want it to if you know how to pick and choose correctly and interpret them in the light of preconceived notions. But if you look at these verses analytically along with the explicit verses where God describes his nature and the explicit verses where Jesus describes God's nature, then they become very, very clear cut. So these verses you're saying that I just mentioned, these are verses that someone can deduct and someone that is a theologian, he wants to prove a point, he'll take these and try to prove it. But overall, there's no clear cut, unambiguous statement where Jesus, peace be upon him, ever said, I am your creator, worship me. Never. He never said there's, that. There's not a verse in the Bible with that explicit statement. You heard it here on The Dean Show. Number eight, talk to me. Brother. Number eight was that no one, the Bible says by God's own word that no one has ever seen God at any time. This is very clear. In John 1 18, it says no man has seen God at any time. In 1 John, no man has seen God at any time. Even Jesus' own statement in John 5 and 37, Jesus says, And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me, and you have neither heard his voice nor seen his face at any time. And Jesus was standing right there amongst them. So had he been God, why would he say you have never seen God at any time? You understand? This is yeah. what I'm talking about. This is clear cut. You have never seen God. If he would have been God, he would have said, You're looking at God right now. You want to see God? Look at me. 
You have seen him. And there are some verses in the Bible someone can reiterate and say, okay, we said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You know, if you've seen the Father, then you, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. Or, you know, I and the Father are one. You know, and when you, but if you read the context of those verses, rather than just taking a sentence out, if you read the context of four or five different verses, you will see that he was speaking of being one in purpose. Even in the one where he said, I and the Father are one, he was speaking about just as no one can pluck the children of God out of God's hand, yeah. no one can pluck them out of my hand because I and I, Father, are one. Meaning that we are one in purpose. We have the same exact mission. I am coming as God's message bearer to humanity. We are one and the same in, in what we want from you. I am God's representative. Anything that he wants is my will. So if you understand them in that light explicitly, then you understand that Jesus said, no man have seen God at any time. And this is also in the Quran. Moses asked to see God in the Quran. And he said, look at the mountain. If the mountain can see me, then you, if it can bear my, my sight, then you can see me. And we know that when God showed himself to the mountain, it crumbled into pieces. And then Moses repented and said, I'm sorry, basically, that I, I, don't, I don't want to see you. We cannot stand to see God. God is not something that can come in the form of a human being. I mean, you cannot contain God's essence inside of a physical form. That is to lessen God beyond extent, to put him inside of a physical form. He's we, too great. He's too great to be put in any form, in any dynamiters, in any parameters, in any dimensions, any box. You can't put God inside a box. Top 10 reasons why Jesus, peace be upon him, the one we love who's one of the mightiest messengers of God. He delivered the same message that there's only one God. Worship Him alone, not His creation. He cannot be God. Number seven, talk to me, brother. Number seven is this concept was not taught by Jesus or His disciples, nor was it believed in by His followers and uh, the early followers of Christianity. As we see when, when they found the Dead Sea Skulls in Qumran, we see that the early Christians were still a part of Judaism. For instance, when, if you read the book of Acts, when Jesus Christ had, had, had departed from this earth, the, the disciples still uh, daily attended the synagogue. They still daily went to the temple at Jerusalem and worshipped as the Jews worship, because this is what Jesus Christ brought. He brought the renewal of the laws of Moses. So if the disciples were running around teaching people that Jesus was God, they would have been banished out of the temple the day they walked in, or they would have started their own church. But no, neither did Jesus. Jesus went to the temple himself. He did not build his own church anywhere and say, worship me. He went to the temple and worshiped God in the same way that Moses worshiped God, the same way that Abraham worshiped God, the same way that David worshiped God, the same way that Zechariah worshiped God. You know, he did the exact same thing and his disciples followed him. And if you look at the first second century Christians, they did the same thing. The, 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 the people of Qumran, the first disciple who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were also a part of Judaism. They considered themselves Judaism, uh, uh, practicing Jews mm -hmm. who followed Jesus as their prophet. So we see that nothing had changed. This whole concept of Trinity did not come about until the third century of the church, and it was not formulated as a doctrine that must be believed in until 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea when um, all of the bishops and the, and, the, and the scholars of Christianity would started to form into Christianity after Paul came together and said, okay, this is a doctrine that we must believe in. And the first person to expound this doctrine was Paul, who never saw Jesus Christ himself, never walked with him, never talked to him, never saw him, never ate with him, never learned from him. It was something that he formulated off a vision that he said he had while he was on the road to Damascus to actually persecute Christians. So this was, he was the first person to ever come up with this title of Christian, ever come up with this title of Trinity, ever come up with the Godship of Jesus Christ or Only Begotten Son. All of these things came with Paul the Apostle. Is the word Trinity ever mentioned in the Bible? It does not exist. And there's only one verse that even barely mentions it. It's 1 John 5 and 7. And there are three that bear record on earth, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there are three bear record heaven, the blood, the water. And, but if you go and research that verse, almost all biblical scholars have ex removed that verse from the Bible because it is not a verse that was ever in the Bible. If you go get a, rever a revised standard version of the Bible, a new standard version of the Bible, all of those have removed that verse because it is explicitly not a part of the Bible. It is not found in any manuscript before 1200. God is one, not three in one. Worship Him alone. We're talking about the Creator of the heavens and the earth, that He cannot be a man. The top ten reasons why Jesus, peace be upon Him, cannot be God. We are on number six. six. Number six reason is a very big one and very plain one. Jesus ate, slept, and prayed. He ate, slept, and prayed. And we know God by His very nature is self-sufficient. He does not need anything to continue His existence. God does not need to eat. God does not need to sleep. God does not need to pray. 
God is not in need of anything because if he was in need of something, then he would not be God. He would need something else other than himself to exist. That would therefore would not make him, that would take away his Godship. And we know that Jesus Christ was born. We know that he ate. We know that he slept and we know that he prayed. Had he not ate, slept or drank any water, he would have died. Therefore, he was not self-sufficient. He needed something to continue his existence. Therefore, by his very nature of not being self-sufficient and God being self-sufficient, those two things can't mix. You can't be self-sufficient and not self-sufficient all at the same time. And then Jesus prayed. He was in need of prayer. Anytime he had an issue, he would pray. He would tell the disciples, I need to go pray. Wait here while I pray. Wait here while I pray. He would go to the temple, pray, prostrating on his face on the ground. This in his very nature showed that he was in need of something greater than himself because that is the essence of prayer. It's showing that you're in need of someone who is greater than you. Even people who worship idols, they believe that idol is greater than them, therefore they pray to it. So if Jesus was God, who, why was the need of his prayer? He would have been telling people to pray to him. You need, my, you need to pray to me. I don't need to pray to anyone. So therefore, by his very nature of necessity, of him being in need of something else, he cannot be God. We're halfway through here on The Dean Show. The top 10 reasons why Jesus, peace be upon him, cannot be the creator of the heavens and the earth. He was indeed a mighty messenger sent by the creator of the heavens and earth, but he is not God. Sit tight. Don't go nowhere. Some people are getting a little restless. We're not trying to hurt nobody's feelings. We're here to deliver the truth. Stop trying to sit here and, 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 and let your mind play with you and try to refute something. Just sit tight. We're almost through and listen. Open your mind. Be humble hearted. Let's go to number five. Number five. Number five reason is that Jesus claimed that God's knowledge was greater than his. When he was asked about the hour, the day of judgment, he said, of that day knoweth no man, nor the angels in heaven, nor, 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 nor the, the, the son, but only the father has knowledge of that hour. So if he would have been God, he would have known that. How could God, if the Trinity was indeed true, and God was God, Jesus was God, the Holy Spirit was God, they're all the same person. That means that how does one not know the same information that the other one knows if they are the same person? If God knows the hour, Jesus should know the hour. The Holy Spirit should know the hour. They should have all known that thing, but even Jesus said in another verse, in John 14, 28, He said, the Father is greater than I. He admitted the Father is greater than I. So if they are equals, how can one be greater than the other? If they are both indeed God, how could one be greater than the other? So showing that Jesus did not have the exact same knowledge that God has, how could he be God? You see, these are statements that are very explicit. And if you weigh all of these statements against the ambiguous ones, which ones are going to weigh out more? Point blank, explicit, to the point statements, or statements that can be interpreted this way, that way, by anyone who walks and wants to give them an interpretation. These cannot be interpreted any other way than Jesus was not God. He was something less than God. This is making total sense, and I'm sure it's making total sense to a lot of people because this is what we have. You don't have to be a doctor, a theologian, a scientist. The layman can understand this. All right? Let's go to number four, brother. Um, right before we get to number four, you were just speaking about how, you know, everyone should be able to understand this. This concept of Trinity cannot be explained to a child. Let's take a six, seven-year-old child and explain to him the Trinity. It, he would never con grasp that concept and God's way of life is something that sh is for everyone. It should be able to be explained to someone who is illiterate. It should be able to explain to someone who has a PhD in rocket science. It should be able to explain to a child. It should be able to explain to a deaf person. But you cannot explain this concept of Trinity. There was a British man, and it was one of the most interesting parables that I had ever read and come across. It was a uh, British professor named Richard Parsons. Mm -hmm. And he was debating this concept of Trinity with a friend of him who was a Trinitarian. And they were debating this issue, and a carriage came along. And it had three people in it. And the friend, the Trinitarian, said, look, look, there's a good example of the Trinity. One carriage, three people in it. He said, no, you want to show me the Trinity? Show me one person in three carriages. <laughs> one person in three carriages. He said, then I'll believe your Trinity. Show me one person, the same person in three different carriages. Then you will have explained to me the Trinity. That means nothing to me. So that, I thought that was very interesting because it's a concept that, and, that you can't explain. It's unexplainable. One plus one plus one equals one. Or one times one times one equals one. All these things, the egg with the yolk and the coat and the shirt, all, you know, these are things that is not understandable by anybody unless you have some rocket science PhD and then they would even be confused. So God's, and even in the Bible, even in the Bible, God says he is not the author of confusion. So if that is confusing him, someone else must have authored this whole idea. But when you tell that same child that there is a creator who created you, worship him alone. 
He's yeah. only one. He's the only one that you should worship. One. They That's can it. understand that. They can understand that. That mm -hmm. child right there. That child can barely understand it. One God. One God. It's not like a pie. You split them up. No, it's not like a pie. It's okay, we're coming down to number four. To number four. <laughs> Top ten reasons why Jesus can't be God on the Dean Show. Talk to us, brother. Number four is that Jesus explicitly states that he is not God. Now, we think that Jesus implicitly states that he is God. There are some ambiguous verses, but what about where he explicitly states that he is not God? For instance, in John 17 and 3, he said, And this is life eternal. This is the way to eternal life that they may know you, the one true God, one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent as a messenger. He said, this is, the, in a nutshell, what I have come to teach, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And anyone who is a Muslim, that statement makes very, very, very good sense, because it's even a part of our faith where you would say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah wa Isa Rasulullah, which means that there is no God but one God. Muhammad is his messenger and Jesus is his messenger, which means they are ones who were sent. And that's the tenet of our faith, to believe in the one true God and Jesus Christ who was sent. Very simple, very explicit. And then also he told, uh, when, after he was uh, in, in the Bible, when he ascended to God, he told, he told them, he said, Jesus saith unto her, he's speaking to Mary Magdalene, I ascend unto my father and your father, my God and your God. He very clearly equated her God and his God as being the one and same God. He didn't say, I'm going to ascend to myself. And to your God and to me. You know, these, this, this doesn't make any sense. If even if somebody would have said that, you'd have been, this man is a fool and a half. If he's saying, I'm going to ascend into myself. Your God is me and I'm going to myself. And, you know, all of these things are not. But he very, very clearly stated, the one true God and I am ascending to my God and your God. Point blank clear. Those things can't get any more simple. So that was number four. We need you to put your emotions to the side. Like we said, we're not trying to upset anybody. We're trying to relay the truth. And you've got to be honest with yourself. This is something that just makes sense. It goes with your innate nature. Watch out for the person that tries to put the wool over your eyes and tries to tell you otherwise. All right? Trying to explain something that you see very clearly is not what it is. You know God is one. It's something that's embedded inside of you already. And we're going to continue on proving this. And remember, Jesus is beloved to our hearts. And so we're clearing his name here. He was a mighty messenger. Brother, we are coming down to the top three now. We came from ten. We're down to three. This is almost over. Be sincere with yourself. Listen to the rest. Let's go. Number three, brother. Number three is that even when you get to the title Son of God, even when you get the title Only Begotten Son of God, this is not an exclusive title to Jesus Christ, which many people think. There are many, 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 many instances where the word son of God is used. And if anyone would study Jewish culture, especially ancient Jewish culture, or Orthodox Jewish culture, to be called a son of God is, is a title of esteem and a title of prestige and honor, even being called Lord. Someone would come to their rabbi and they would refer to him as my Lord. This is something that is known by, West, uh, by Eastern Europeans also. They refer to people as Lord. So this title is not exclusive. And Jacob and Solomon in Exodus are called sons of God. Ephraim and Jeremiah, Adam is called son of God in the New Testament. Common people are called sons of God in the New and Old Testament. So these are not something that is an exclusive title as son of God. And I had a, I had a discussion with a uh, pastor about this. He said, yes, but Jesus was the only begotten son of God. And I said, okay, what gives him that exclusive title? What is the characteristic that gives him that exclusive title? He says the New Testament says, that, yes, but there must be a reason why he has this exclusive title. He says, because he was born miraculously without a father. And in, and in Jewish culture, your lineage was from your father's side. You know, you, you, would, you would be the son of your father, of his father. That's how your lineage was traced, not through the mother. So therefore, since his lineage stopped in Mary, he had no father. Therefore, God must be his father. I said, okay, that makes sense. That would make sense to an average human being. I said, but if that is the characteristic for his exclusive sonship, that he has no father, I said, what about Adam and Eve? They had no father nor mother. They were fashioned, as God says, by his own hands out of dirt. And he just made them out of nothing. Nothing existed other than creation. And he made Adam and then from her made Eve. I mean, from him, he took the rib out and made Eve. So if anyone has the exclusive title to be the only begotten son of God, it should have been Adam. 
Because not only was he not have a father or mother, he was the first creation. Therefore, why does he not have that title? Why are we not worshiping him as the exclusive son of God? And he had no answer to that. And it was not to bash him. It was just to say that this is not an exclusive to say, oh, because he has no father, he is God's exclusive son. This was the extreme miracle that was exclusive. One of the exclusive things for the children of Israel to Jesus, about Jesus Christ was that he had no father. He had no father at all. He came directly from a virgin who had never touched another human being, and that was his miracle. That was, if you read the Quran, it explains it very clearly. When Mary brought the child, they, they accused her of adultery. But the miracle was, was that God made Jesus speak in the womb. He, he made him speak as a baby and said that I am the messenger of God. Don't, are, you, are you surprised that God can do this? God can do anything. That's why Jesus was giving more miracles than almost any other prophet. He was giving physical miracles to soften the deadened heart of the children of Israel at that time. That's why he was given such great miracles to heal the blind, to heal the sick, to bring people back to, to, to life from the dead, being born of a virgin. All of this was because this was one of God's last messages. He was the next to last messenger to be sent to the children of Israel and they rejected him. That's when God decided to send Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a mercy to all the worlds. Because we even know that Jesus was not sent to all the world. He was sent to the Jews. Even in his own statements, he said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He is not a prophet for everyone. He was a prophet that was exclusively for their people, as was every prophet before him. Every nation was sent a messenger. Children of Israel sent more than anyone. But finally, God decided to send one for the blanket of humanity, and that was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who even said that Jesus Christ spoke of him. And that doesn't take anything away from Jesus? Just take nothing away from Jesus. Jesus is all. actually one of the patriarch messengers of Islam. There are five. And he is actually one of the most patriarch messengers of Islam. And even Muhammad said that when it comes to someone who is like me, he, he, he is someone who is just like me, and not only in his message, but in the time of span that we were away from each other is Jesus. He's the closest prophet to me in message and in time of, of frame, because it was only about 600 years. Is there a chapter in the Quran we know of that is called after Jesus, peace be upon his mother? Yes, there's, uh, there's, a ver there's chapter 19 in the Quran is, is titled Surah Maryam, which means the chapter of Mary. It is an exclusive chapter that is named after the mother of Jesus Christ, Mary. And that is also another tenet of Islam, that you must believe that Mary was the greatest woman and the most pious woman ever. That is our, the, she, when it comes to women, Mary is on top of the list as being the one who we believe is the most pious woman ever on the face of the planet. And that is the tenet of our faith, to believe in Mary, that she was pious and that she was born, she was a virgin when she had Jesus Christ. And this, this if anyone wants to read the true, what they call the, the nativity story, you know, the story of Jesus' birth, go read chapter 19 of the Quran. It will make you cry. It will make you cry because it made me cry the first time I read it because it's nothing like the Bible. It is in a more beautiful tone of language and a more soft-spoken and a more true manner than you can have ever read in any other book. Was that number two, brother? That was number three. That was number three. We're going to number two in a second. I just want to make a couple points that we need to really think when we say that God had a son. What do we mean? Because we know as human beings now, we see that dogs have puppies, cats have kittens, what do gods have? Baby gods? So when we just think about this, it's absurd to say that, look, I had uh, a son, he's a goldfish. It doesn't make sense. Or, or to say that I have a son and he's me. <laughs> I had myself. I had myself. It I made myself. It doesn't make sense. You can't clone God. No, it doesn't make sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. And then if the son, he grows up, he's going to have the attributes of the father. So if the baby son can die, then the father naturally can die. And these yes. are qualities we don't give to the Creator. He doesn't die. He can't die. He doesn't have a beginning. So I wanted to point these few things out. Let's go to the next reason of the top ten reasons why Jesus, peace be upon him, cannot be the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Number two. Number two, and now we're getting down to, as they say, the nitty-gritty, the, the, the real home hitters. God cannot change. In Malachi, God himself, this is an explicit statement that is directly attributed to God. Whether it's from God or not, who knows. But this is a statement that is attributed directly to God. God says, I do not change. Therefore, the sons of Jacob are not consumed. 
he was stating that I do not change in my nature. I don't be happy one day, sad the other day, angry the next day. I, I, I don't. His nature does not change. Therefore, God cannot be subjected to the same laws which he created. For instance, God created time. Therefore, he cannot be subjected to time. He does not pass through time. He doesn't get old. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get sleepy. He doesn't go through the same stages of time that we go through. He created air. Therefore, he doesn't need it. He created the sun. Therefore, he doesn't need his warmth. He doesn't get hot. He doesn't get cold. These things do not happen to God. God cannot put himself into a human body, come on this earth, be subjected to time, be subjected to, to hunger, be subjected to, to tiredness, be subjected to being whipped and beat and hurt. These are things that God cannot, by his very nature, be. Some people say, you know, uh, that God can do anything. And that is not a correct statement. Because there's, God can do anything that is permeant to his nature. For instance, God cannot go to hell. God cannot go to heaven. God cannot die. God wasn't born. God doesn't eat. There are certain things he cannot do because it would be against his nature. It would be against his Godship. It would make him less than God. So God can do anything except that which would make him less than God. Anything that is, and that's why in Islam he has attributes. Clearly laid out attributes which get, keep him as the title of God. Any attribute that can be attributed to human beings is something that cannot be attributed to God. But things that are attributed to God like mercy can be attributed to us. But anything that is attributed to us cannot be attributed to God because it would make him less than God. This is a very important point because people will try to refute you and say, well, God can do anything. Yes. But we want to make this clear that the creator of the heavens and the earth, God Almighty, he doesn't do things that are not, for instance, if he had no beginning, he doesn't die now. Yeah, right? Man. So if he's the most just, he's not going to do injustice. So we, his attributes of being uh, self-sufficient, so that means he now he's not going to be needy of somebody. No. Uh, for instance, now another example is God is the most, he's the truthful. Can yes. I say that? He's not going to lie. He's not going to lie. He, he cannot lie. He cannot lie. Uh, what else could we say? So really I want people to understand this point. He cannot lie. He cannot murder someone unjustly. God can't steal from someone. All of these things that we do that make us less than perfect, God cannot do because he is perfect. Mm -hmm. Anything that would subtract from his nature as being God, he cannot do. If something makes him less than God, then he cannot do it. Not only will he not do it, it's something he cannot do because it's, it's just like putting a north and a south magnet, two big magnets, they will not go together because they cannot coexist together. Natures that are not God-like cannot exist in God. They can only exist in his creation because he created those very natures. Those are things that we came about and we have derived in our own nature. Therefore, God cannot have them because he does not change. God is not like one way today and then he wakes up another way tomorrow. And that is another reason why the Trinity cannot be. God would not be one, 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 one forever and ever. And then all of a sudden, oh, I decide I'm going to be three today. Or three and one or one and three or however you want to do the math. He does not change in the middle of, of the whole scenario and say, you know what, oh, I'm going to change the whole method of salvation. Got to be consistent. God is very consistent. He is a consistent uh, uh, God. He does not change. Therefore, we know for sure he's not going to change his method of salvation. The method of salvation has always been the same, is that you have to go to God directly by showing that you are worthy of forgiveness, by working and earning forgiveness, and therefore he forgives you and then doing good deeds. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it's always going to be. Nothing is going to change in the middle. The end is never going to change. This is going to be the method of salvation. And when Jesus Christ returns, which is also a tenet of our faith, that we believe Jesus Christ will return to this earth, he will make these things very clear. The first thing he will do is he will break the crosses. I was not crucified. The second thing is he will kill the swine, saying that I never broke the law of Moses. I came to teach the law of Moses, therefore I never broke it. And these are all the things that he will come to explain, that I am not God, I am not the Son of God, do not worship me, I did not break the law of Moses, and then he's going to command people to follow the way of Islam as a Muslim. So that was number two now we covered. That's number two. Before we go to the number one reason why Jesus, peace be upon him, cannot be the creator of the heavens and earth, I want to stop here for a moment and discuss really quickly what we are trying to do here is to help give the true nature of 
of who God is. Yes. That he's not a man, definitely. He yes. cannot be a man, all right? Yes. But now, when we make the testimony of faith, because there's probably some people that have been following the show for a while, and now we want to emphasize that there's a negation and affirmation. Yes. We're making a negation here. La ilaha illallah. Yes. That we're negating any other deity, that nothing in this creation can be the creator. There's only one true creator. Yes. So let's talk about this a little bit. So now the people, because we don't want to throw someone totally off and say, where do I go from here? Yes. We want to give them something else to come to. Absolutely. And we want to know people that we're not, because some people may think that we're just bashing one certain way. And it's, it's not that. We are trying to show the true essence of God and Jesus Christ. We're actually sitting here in defense of Jesus. This is the whole purpose of me coming up with this subject, was that I love Jesus very much. And I want to defend his nature because he would have abhorred people having worshipped him, which we will see in just a moment. But the negation and affirmation is what we have been talking about. The first part of La ilaha illallah is La ilaha, which means that there is no other God. There is no God that has right to be worshipped in the law except the one true God. That is what we are trying to state, that there is nothing under the heavens or earth. There is no angels, no man, no beast, no idols that has right to be worshipped except the one true God, the creator of everything. That is the first part of affirmation that someone has to come to in Islam, and that's what we're trying to bring them to. That there's one God, He's the creator of everything, He's the only one that deserves to be worshipped. He created you without asking anyone's permission. He did not have to ask your father and mother to make you. He did not have to ask Jesus to make you. He did not have to ask Moses to make you. Therefore, you have to ask no one in order to worship Him. You go to Him alone, by yourself, worship Him as one, as the Creator. And then when you realize that there is one God, then you have to figure out what is His message. What does He want from me? And that's where God's messengers come in. And for the humanity now, that messenger would be Muhammad, who was someone that Jesus foretold of. Jesus very clearly in the New Testament foretold of the coming of Muhammad as the last and final messenger and as the mercy unto mankind. And He is the one who told us how we should live. And it's nothing new. Everyone thinks that Islam is such a weird and, and new and different. It's way out there. But if you really, really study the way of Jesus, if you study the way of Moses, if you study the way of Abraham, if you go to the Bible and do your real research, you'll see that all we're doing is affirming the ways of old. All we have done is taken, we have not ticked the clock back on, on, on the world, as people say, we have stepped back in time. No, we have stepped back to worshiping God in the way that He needs to be worshipped, and we have stepped back to living a life that is in tune with the way He wants it to be lived. That doesn't mean we want to ride around on camels and, and, and do away with technology and cell phones. We need these things. I have a car, I have a cell phone, I have all of these things that we need. This, that's the part of the time. But when it comes to my direct relationship with God, we have to go back to the way the prophets worshipped him. And that's what Islam does. What do we mean? Because I keep saying on every show, worship the Creator, not His creation. What do we mean when we say worship the Creator alone? What do we actually mean? That worshiping the Creator alone comes from the word Islam, which means that you submit your entire self to doing what God wants you to do alone. That is the essence of worshiping, deciding that whatever God wants from me, that is what I'm going to do. And that's what Jesus Christ did his entire life. If you research his life, it was entirely that whatever God wanted from him, he did it. That is the essence of a Muslim. If God wants me to pray five times a day, that is what I do. And that is not even enough. That's the way a Muslim should feel. That's the way anyone who loves God should feel, is that there's not enough I can do for God for creating me. If he wants me to fast during the month of Ramadan, I fast out of gratefulness. If he wants me to uh, abstain from, from, from drinking or abstain from sex without marriage, then I do that because that's the way of life that is pleasing to him. And that's what we mean by worship him. That means you make every step of your daily life in accordance with what God wants from you. So basically, you become a slave to God. Basically. Because you're a slave to somebody, let's be you're honest. You're always a slave you're to somebody or something. To somebody. You're a slave to, to uh, your boss at work. You're a slave to that woman who's taking the money out of your pocket every day. Or to the money. To the money. So you're a slave to something. Yes. So we're saying, look, God is saying, be a slave to Him. Yes. Let Him dictate your life. You call on Him alone. He's the only one that can forgive your sins if you're in distress. You're not self-sufficient. You need a creator. You yes. need someone to turn to. So you turn to Him alone. You pray only to Him. Yes. You sacrifice only to, only him. to him. You give charity in His name. In his not name. to look good in front of the people or the congregation. You only no. do it to please Him. Absolutely. And you fast in yes. His name. You abstain from alcohol, drugs, 
for him. You do yes. it because he doesn't benefit from that. You benefit from it, yes. correct? Yes. And you don't lie. You don't steal. You don't cheat. Everything, God is good. He only accepts good. So by being a slave to him... And that's it. You, that's, you become a perfect human. You, you, you become you, a, a perfect, almost a perf close almost to the close perfection to of you. Perf perfect human, of humanity. And that is something in Islam. We believe, we believe that you can get better and better. There's no limit to how good you can be. We're not born with an innate sin nature that we carry with us our entire lives. You can be as good as you want to be. And if everyone in humanity had that, what kind of world would we live in? You, you, that's how you get to that excellence of a human being, is by submitting yourself to the Creator, living a life, how he wants you to live. And this is the point I really wanted to embed yes. in the people that being a slave to God, worshiping him alone, is doing everything that God wants, that you, God to wants you to do. And that's the same thing in the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done mm -hmm. on earth, earth and is in heaven. heaven. How does yes. that verse go? Talk yeah, to it's it's um, basically the Lord's Prayer is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us uh, in, in to, not into temptation. We didn't include this in one of the te top ten. We could have made this uh, one yeah, of them, that could have been the, the, the Lord's top Prayer, top your will being done. And we've only done the top ten. You know, there could be a top 100. We're going to do so, another top ten. There's so many reasons. Yeah, so I wanted to really embed this. So, la ilaha illallah, that there's no deity, there's no God except the one true God. In Arabic, we say Allah, Jesus, He said Allah. Is this correct? That's exactly. In Aramaic, uh, the name for God is Allah. In the, in the uh, uh, Jews and, and Arabs who read the Bible in Arabic, what is the Allah. word for God? Allah. Allah is in the, it's in the... Go pick up any Bible, go to any hotel. You know, in the front, the Gideons, they have the different translations. Go read the verse in Arabic and you'll see the word Allah is right there. So the word God, the English language, this word God didn't even exist. Never existed until 600 years ago. Okay, these are strong points. We did shows on these things, but I really, I want to, I, I, I feel very, very uh, uh, excited to talk to you about this. It's a vast topic. We're giving you the top 10 reasons why Jesus can't be God, but I wanted to stress what we're inviting you to. So we covered this. Let's go now. But in essence, one thing to make it very simple for everyone is that what makes us worshiping God is that we are the only creation He gave a free will to. The only creation he gave a free will to. And the essence of worship is that we accept that and then decide we're going to give that will back to God. In order for what? For paradise. What an exchange we get. We give something back that was given to us in the first place. And in exchange for that, we get eternal paradise. That's the essence of worship. God gave me a free will. I willingly decide to give it back. I don't want to do what I want to do. I want to do what you want to do, which is what the, Jesus said, Muhammad said, Moses said, and therefore, in exchange for that, I get eternal paradise. Ain't you sick That's of doing what, what you want to do? You're hitting a dead end, put the Walkman on, you're drinking, just bobbing your head all day and night, 30, 40 years pass, you get fat, you earn some money and you die, and you didn't do what God told you to do, then what? You think you earn paradise now? Let's talk about the number one reason. We could go on with another show about yes. these other things. The number one reason why Jesus, peace be upon him, is not God, cannot be God. The most essential reason why Jesus cannot be God is that God is the essence of worship. God is the object of worship. God is the person whom we worship. No matter what religion you follow, whoever they call God is their object of worship. It's who they give their devotion to, it's who they make their prayers to, it's who they make their sacrifices to, it's who they pay their charity in the name of, God. Whatever God they call it, whether, you know, where they call it Krishna, where they call it Buddha, whatever is their God, that's who they give their worship to. So had Jesus been God, he would have told people to worship him. And, but in fact, in Matthew 15 and 18, he did the exact opposite. He told people, in vain shall you worship me. Predicting the future, in vain shall you worship me and teach as doctrine the commandments of men. Not of me, not of God. You will teach as doctrine the commandments of men. That means you will teach as doctrine the commandments of a trinity, which come from man. You will teach us doctrines that I am God, which will come from men. You will teach us doctrines that throw away the law of Moses and the law of God, which will come from men. But the worship you give to me shall be in vain. And we all know what the word vain means. It will not count for anything. We will go before God on the day of judgment, having worshipped Jesus 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And on the day of judgment, Jesus will deny those people. It is already stated when God asked Jesus in the Quran on the day of judgment, did you command anyone to worship me? And Jesus will say, no, you know I would not do anything except for what you told me to. And all of these prayers and everything that is being made to Jesus are in vain because he does not hear these things because he is not an object of worship. He is not an object of worship. And therefore we are being tricked. 
It is a trick that has come about upon us, and, and, and unfortunately, to be harsh, it is a trick that has come from the one who is the author of tricks, who is the devil. And he's already said in the Quran that he will get people to worship him falsely. He will get people to worship idols falsely. He will get people to worship these things falsely. And on the day of judgment, he will leave you. He will say, I tricked you, now I'm free from you. I already got you, I'm gone, I'm out. I have nothing to do with you because I already got you to do what I wanted you to do for so long. Now it means nothing. It will be just like dust. All these piles of prayers and sacrifices you've made will be just like a blast of wind will come and just blow them into dust. They will be worth nothing. So Jesus himself said, do not worship me. Even when someone came to him and said, good master. He said, why you call me good master? There's none good but one that's God. Or they came and called him master. He said, why do you call me master? You don't do my father's works. You know, he always denied that worship. When anyone would ever try to worship him, he would deny it. Some people may have called him Lord, and they said he didn't rebuke him because it's his title of respect. But no one ever gave a devout worship to Jesus without him rejecting it. That's it. It's very clear and simple. Let's go back to the original. Adam, the first man created by God. Did he call upon Jesus? Did he worship God as a three and a one? Did he go ahead and do some of these things that people are doing? He directed his worship. To God. To God. It's very simple. Let's go back to do what he did. Let's go back to do what Abraham did. Did Every they call prophet. upon Jesus? Did they call upon uh, any other human being? If you, if you look at it, and we are supposed to follow the prophets, Adam worshiped God alone. Abraham worshiped God alone. Uh, Moses worshiped God alone. Noah worshiped God alone. David worshiped God alone. Uh, Jesus worshiped God alone. Jesus never called on Jesus. And the last and final prophet, Muhammad, called on God alone. So therefore, we should follow them and call on God alone. Brother, thank you very much. We can go on and on, but on our time on. is up. Thank you for uh, coming to be with us to cover the top ten reasons why Jesus cannot be God. We hope Absolutely. to have you again. I look forward to it, and we're going to continue this topic, you know, because it's something that is important. It's the issue of salvation is what we're concerned about. We're not concerned about bashing anyone. We want everyone to go to heaven. It's a tenet of the Islamic religion that you want for your fellow human being, what you want for yourself. I want to die and go to heaven, and I want everyone else to do so. So this is why we do this. No other reason whatsoever. If it were just to bash someone or, or someone's belief or someone's religion, then we'd be wasting our time. God Almighty. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Absolutely. God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of Adam, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. He said, if my slave was to come to me with his sins filled up to the, to the heavens, not associating partners with me, not giving acts of worship to anyone else except him, he would forgive. He is the most merciful, the most loving. Have a relationship, a direct dial up with him alone. Leave off worshiping men, monkeys, cows, animals, all these things. Anything that's in the creation, was in the creation, can never be the creator. Love Jesus as he ought to be loved, as a mighty messenger of God. Come back every week. We're here to help you understand, to develop a better understanding at thedeanshow.com. If you miss us on the TV here in the Chicago local cable station, you can see all of our shows at thedeanshow.com, T-H-E-D-E-E-N show.com. Until next time, we'll see you. Peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum. Check us out on the web.